For 14 years, Neil Woods worked as an undercover narcotics officer in the UK. He infiltrated gangs, busted dealers, plunged himself into the underworld at great personal risk. But after many years and much reflection, he says that approach, that war on drugs, is misguided and does more harm than good. We ask him why up next on The Interview. Former undercover cop Neil Woods, the author of Good Cop, Bad War and Drug Wars, the terrifying inside story of Britain's drug trade, joins us now. Good to have you on the program, Neil. It's a big topic. It's a passionate and divisive topic uh, for many people. And before I get to, I guess, what your thoughts are on how to wage this war differently or how to wage it at all or not wage it, Let's uh, learn a little bit about your story. So tell us about your, your time as an undercover cop in the narcotics unit and what it was like. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me on. Um, yeah, I, I went into undercover policing by accident, really, as a young officer. Um, to, because of the moral panic that was going on in the UK about crack cocaine and heroin. And so I, what I would do is I would go into an inner city area and I would spend uh, several weeks befriending really vulnerable people, people who were using drugs very problematically, and get them to introduce me to gangsters who were dealing on the streets, essentially. And then I would uh, spend months gathering evidence of conspiracy and seeing how far up the ladder I could climb uh, buying increasing quantities of drugs. The um, but what I would do is I would look for the most vulnerable people on the streets, uh, because the most vulnerable people are the easiest to manipulate. And if that sounds ruthless, well, it is ruthless. That is the nature of that kind of undercover uh, policing. So I remember for one particular operation I worked in in, in Nottingham. And I befriended this man called Cammy, and I spent a long time getting to know him. And I worked out that the reason he was consuming heroin problematically is because he had a very traumatic childhood from a very violent father. And this was a key aspect of all of these vulnerable people that I was manipulating, is that they all had this story of childhood trauma, all of them. They were sexually abused, or they were physically abused, or they were... Um, neglected, quite often alcoholic parents or something like that. But this particular chap, he was also arrested alongside all, all of the serious gangsters, but he ended up being on suicide watch, minute to minute watch when he was in the cells. And the reason for that is because he saw me as his one friend in the world, his one friend he could turn to and that he'd never had anyone he could talk to before. So but he ended up getting three and a half years because he had been committing offences. But it was a rather brutal way uh, to treat people like him who were essentially being exploited by organised crime for their childhood trauma. Hmm. And I wonder, were you feeling guilty? Were you beginning to feel more and more guilty for stitching up these vulnerable people, those who were low-hanging fruit? At, at the bottom of the pile and, and the easiest, as you say, to, to throw into jail? Well, I did, but I kept justifying it to myself ethically. I would go through this thinking process and I would come to the conclusion that the end justified the means, that because at the end of the operation I caught these really dangerous people, then that made it quite justifiable to cause harm to these vulnerable people. And I'll give you an example, if you like. Um, I infiltrated a gang, a very infamous gang in the UK called the Burger Bar Boys. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sometimes told that's a very British name uh, for a gang, but they were much more sinister than they sound. They were using sexual violence as part of their um, reputation building. They were doing the usual kind of gangster things, um, kidnappings and maimings. One of them was involved in seven different murders 
in, in Birmingham. So they were really brutal people. And I spent months and months infiltrating, trying to infiltrate these people. I got an introduction one day by manipulating, again, this vulnerable person who introduced me. And I got interrogated um, by this guy and by five of them. And while I was being interrogated, there was four hundred figures who would walk around me slowly. And every so often, one of them would punch me or headbutt me on the side of the head. It was it was intense, intensely vicious behaviour from their part. But eventually, um, I got in with them. I exchanged phone numbers, and I started by increasing amounts of drugs. One day. Um, they stripped me naked, saying that I was a police, suspected police officer and that I was wearing a wire. Thankfully, I wasn't wearing a wire that day. Um, so by the end of the seven months, I'd taken quite a dislike to this gang, and I was very pleased that I'd gathered evidence against the six main gangsters, but also 90 other people. So wow. 96 people. Everyone involved. I, there was no new phone numbers to get. There was no other new people to meet. I knew I'd caught everyone. In control of the drug supply in that town, everybody. So there were police brought in from all the surrounding police forces. There were hundreds of police involved. And the intelligence officer who was tasked with keeping his ear to the ground as to the impact of that operation he spoke to me afterwards. And he says, Yes, we managed to interrupt the drug supply for a full two hours. Huh. I I was I was convinced I was going to die on multiple occasions. Seven months of work, all that hard work, all of that violence for the sake of interrupting the drug supply so, for two hours. Yeah, but let, let me understand that then. Why would it only have interrupted the drug supply for two hours? How does this power get displaced or, you know, warped or changed? Or t Tell me how it works so that all of this work, all of this impact, all these people behind bars doesn't really mean much and is only a drop in the ocean. Right, OK, so what I'm going to tell you is applicable everywhere in the world. It's, a, it's the same in your country, it's the same in mine, it's the same around the world, because I am part of an international organisation, the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And we are police all over the world who have had the same experiences. So this is a universal truth. The police are really good at catching drug dealers, but that's part of the problem, because police never shrink the, the market. They never make the market smaller. So... When I have success like that, and where police have success in any country, they create a gap in the market. And so you always make somebody very, very happy. So when that gang was arrested in, in the UK, I don't know for certain that it was their infamous rivals, the Johnson crew, that took up that opportunity. But somebody did, and they would have been really happy. They would have heard the news and said, put the call in, boys. We're going to make a fortune. Guess what the cops have done for us? And this is the truth all over the world. You know, police are really good at their jobs generally. And if they catch a burglar in any community, then burglaries will go down. If they catch a crime goes up. Because when you create a gap in the market, more often than not, it actually increases violence because people compete over that opportunity. Oh. It yeah, so, I mean, we, we've seen it all. Heard about it with uh, Mexican drug cartels. We've we've learnt of the concept when it comes to terrorism in the Middle East, right? You you knock out one group and the other group smells blood, and it's an opportunity for them to expand, to swallow up the resources of of the other group, to monopolize the market and the industry. I guess the counter argument is, yeah, the job's not done. You have to knock them all out. Continue <laughs> with the good work. What's your problem with that? Well, because it's not possible. Mm. We've been fighting this war for decades, endless decades, and all that's happened is that organised crime has got more powerful. So police don't shrink the size of the market, but they do change the shape of that market. So what we're doing by policing drugs in a prohibition regime is we are sharpening the sword of organised crime. Organised crime constantly adapts, becomes much more effective, more ruthless and more violent in response to our policing efforts. So if you compare with how aggressive any nation's drug policy is, with nations that have taken a more harm reduction approach, there is a significant difference in the behaviour of organised crime. So, for example, in the UK, we now have 50,000 children dealing heroin and crack cocaine on the front lines. 
that's because we have an extremely punitive drug policy, and very aggressive drugs policing. So organized crime has adapted to use children. Mm. In Sweden, they're even worse. They, they have an even more punitive drug policy and they have open warfare. They had 400 explosions between rival gangs last right. year because there's a constant disruption of that market. The market never shrinks. It never will shrink. It never will. We cannot win this war. It's, it's, right. the, it's, a, it's one of the biggest industries in the world. It's a bigger industry than textiles. We're mm. all wearing textiles. Right? You can't reduce the size of that market through prohibition. It's not possible. So you sharpen the sword of criminality. They get better. They're winning this arms race. They're making a lot of money. And those you end up catching or punishing are not the big guns anyway. They're not the big bosses. Then in, not in any meaning, meaningful way. So you mentioned that word prohibition. So the current world war on drugs, which is spearheaded by the United States, it has been spearheaded by them for the past few decades, I guess, that is under the umbrella of prohibition. Now, there are a whole lot of other terms that float about when it comes to alternatives or solutions or different ways to tackle this. Uh, legalization, decriminalization. Tell me where you stand and tell me what those words mean to you and what, what's actually the right way to... If the, if the current path is the wrong path, what is the right path and who's doing it right? OK, so uh, my organisation takes the position that we need legal regulation, legal control to take the market away from organised crime, to prevent the violence and the corruption that's being caused by criminals controlling this supply network. So by legal regulation, that means governments taking control away from criminals. We avoid the word legalisation because it's a little bit meaningless. We're talking about control, legal regulated control. Um, we also support decriminalisation of the possession of drugs, but that's... That's a step. That's maybe a first step. It, that doesn't take the power away from organised crime. Only, all the decriminalisation does is it stops being people being criminalised for consumption or possession of drugs. Which, of course, we shouldn't be criminalising people for using or possessing drugs. But that's only a first step. Now, a country that is doing it right in relation to um, heroin, for example, is Switzerland, because they actually used British evidence. Um, in 1994 to start prescribing heroin to people who use heroin problematically. And that basically ended their heroin problem. It took away that power from organised crime. It took their business away by medicalising it and looking after people who need that help. And that's what we did in the UK until the end of the 1960s, until we, but we, had, but we changed through pressure from the United States. And that was because the UK owed money to the United States from the Second World War, which gave them great power because they could increase their interest rates if they wanted to. Yeah. And you mentioned the United States. It's important to note that this worldwide war on drugs is essentially American domestic racism exported around the world through aggressive foreign policy because none of these drug laws have ever been based on the harms of the drugs. It's always been about a perception of who's using them and using those laws to persecute people. And that plays out everywhere. Everywhere. In the UK, if, if you're black, you're, you're nine times more likely to be stopped searching for drugs than if you're white. And, you know, this is a racist policy which is being exported by the United States. The empirical research does show that different drugs have different levels of harm, not only to the individual, but, you know, possibly the society, families, friends, society. So... When you look at this and you look at uh, potential policy recommendations, do you separate these things out? Do you say, well, weed is one thing, marijuana is one thing, but heroin's another thing, cocaine's another thing? Do you look at it like that, or are they all in the same bag? No, I mean, that's a very good question, because legal regulation needs to be appropriate regulation according to the risks of the drug. So cannabis, as you say, is at one end um, of, of the spectrum and the kind of regulation that you would need for that is you need to decide who can sell it, where they can sell it, uh, the fact that you would need photo ID to buy it, to protect children, uh, you would need to decide, we would recommend that you would have no advertising for it, no branding, uh, but at the other end of the spectrum you would only ever treat heroin as a medical regulation and so the other drugs in between will be a 
which will be regulated according to their relative risks, and they will be much better controlled government than they will be uh, criminal networks. But you make you make the point about comparative harms. It has been made clear by scientists that by far the most dangerous of all the drugs, both from harms to individual family and, and society, is alcohol. Right. And there's quite a big difference with how much more harmful it is. But you've got centuries upon centuries of cultural tradition built into how people perceive alcohol, so they look at drugs differently. Well, you have centuries, possibly thousands of years of, of culture and human society mm. associated with, with cannabis use as well, right. and the opium. Uh, th these things were relatively normal things, not persecuted, really, at all. Or people f using those drugs weren't persecuted up until the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. And actually, if you look at the Global South, many of the drug laws are hangovers of colonial power and colonial influence. So that the drug laws that are left in place are the remaining power structures of colonial occupation. Where do you stand on some of those countries, especially if we look at, I guess, the Far East, where they're extremely draconian when it comes to their rules, their laws, possession of cannabis could, you know, find you in, in jail for a long, long time. I mean, sometimes there's the death penalty connected to drug use or, or drug possession. Um, obviously, there's a different cultural context from, from which a lot of that emerges. I mean, I remember speaking to somebody about how the opium wars had informed a lot of how a lot of East Asian countries look at drugs coming into their societies as foreign influences, poisoning their societies and stuff. Um, you have a global movement. Are you partial to any of the ideas or arguments that come from countries that say zero tolerance, we're gonna, we're gonna clamp down with extreme brutality? Well, well, I'm not, and the reason for that is that we follow the evidence, and it is quite clear from the evidence that it doesn't matter how brutal a punitive policy, it has no effect on drug consumption. So even the death penalty or life in prison, it has no effect. So the, these, these brutal policies are only causing harm to citizens with no positive impact at all. And the evidence is clear on that, and I don't think it's unreasonable to follow the evidence. But you mentioned Southeast Asia. There are changes, a beginning of changes being talked about even there. You know, there is a worldwide shift towards uh, an evidence-based drug policy. I was talking to two Malaysian uh, MPs um, at a course I was teaching at just about three weeks ago, and they were making the point that there is a very serious discussion in Malaysia about decriminalizing the possession of drugs simply because they have an overcrowded prison problem. Mm. And this is causing them a serious societal problem. So... You know, drug law reform can be a very pragmatic political decision. And actually, it doesn't take too long for the public to start supporting what they see as a positive step when they see the evidence. And the pragmatism could be born out of something completely unrelated to drugs. It could just be to do with prison crowding. Yeah, exactly. And that is the discussion in mm. Malaysia and some other parts of Southeast Asia. But, yeah. And that is an important point, because when you've got a prison overcrowding, you are traumatising a section of mm. your population. And actually what you're doing is you're hardwiring your problematic drug use for the next generation where you've got right. children missing parents or other family members. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the concept of trauma because I want to bring this back to what you did and how it affected you. So we, we spoke a little bit about the guilt that you felt. You had to build relationships with a lot of people and you ended up being the guy who put them behind bars. There's an element of betrayal and, you know, winning over their trust and stitching them up. Um, tell me a little bit about your journey after you decided to quit the job and, and, and what was going on with you emotionally. Well, I'm, I'm diagnosed um, with PTSD and it's a complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it is complicated from, in, my, in my way because... Part of my condition is what's called moral injury. Moral injury was first identified in veterans, US veterans returning from the Vietnam War. Uh, but I also have, um, you know, I had so many near-death experiences. I, I remember once a heroin dealer opened the, the door to me and put a samurai sword to my throat. Mm. And then after I was walking away from that, another person tried to rob me at knife point uh, with the, for the heroin I'd just bought. So 
there's just so many of those instances. And of course, these things take their toll. I didn't realize it at the time. But so I had quite a breakdown. You know, I didn't understand what was going on. It took a long time to get diagnosed, you know, three psychiatrists later. And um, so it's been a struggle, but it, it has been a very positive thing for me to be able to uh, make sense of my experiences by being part of this global movement for change to so that my other my colleagues don't have to go through this you know because there are police all over the world becoming traumatized because they have to fight this futile war and it does happen everywhere and for the poor people being persecuted by the police you know mm. so this this is a fight that I feel duty bound to be part of and it has it has helped me deal with my mental health struggles uh, like so many of us in the movement right uh, to be able, to be able to have this platform and actually um explain these 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 facts to people so again thank you for giving me this opportunity today i don't know if you can actually see it uh from your end via your skype connection but we have you in the video wall there's a there's an image of you from when you were much younger you were smashing the brill cream bottle i think you know the hair's all slick back on the top a lot more hair back then so presumably i mean we got it from you from your from your website in a bomber jacket there on the corner that's you playing the role, right? That's you undercover. Presumably one of the other cops took a, an image of, a picture of you from across the road uh, from some surveillance uh, spot. And it reminded me, when I looked at that, it reminded me of that movie Donnie Brasco, you know, where Johnny Depp infiltrates um, the gang and Al Pacino's his, his handler and it's got the slick back hair. And in that movie, Donnie is undercover, but he also has to go home to his wife and kids. And that scenario becomes very complicated and very difficult for him to juggle. It affects his personal life a lot. Tell me about Neil Woods as Donny Brasco. Tell me about how it affected your personal life and your family life. You've got kids, right? Yeah, I do have two, do have two kids um, who were at the time, they were young kids. But I used to actually arrange my legend wherever when I was working so that I could take time off at weekends quite often so I would have the really strange situation that I'd be having a, in fear of my life buying heroin and crack cocaine in the week and then still take my kids swimming on a Sunday morning mm. which was a very very strange um shift um so yeah I mean it, it could it could be a strain at times but I think it became much more so later on because I, I, I was dealing with trauma and I didn't realize I was starting to suffer from PTSD and I was still doing the work. So it, it became more difficult, but, but I, I still managed to keep that separation. I think uh, my, my behavior um, at home didn't change. Right. Well, I don't know how many cops would be watching this program. I mean, there might be cops who are searching for you on YouTube as well, because a lot of people go down that rabbit hole as they're looking into other ways of doing this in, in the war on drugs. Um, for those who are currently involved, for those policemen who probably are undercover right now, out there fighting this fight, infiltrating gangs, uh, putting corner boys behind bars, your message to them is what? Most police I meet, they understand exactly what I'm talking about. We know, we know as police officers that this is a futile war, but we do as we're told because we are duty bound to follow the orders and we'll never walk back from a fight, right? So I know that you're fighting this war, but we as police officers, we have the power to change the world because we have knowledge that the public doesn't have, that the public needs to have this knowledge because if the public is better formed about this policy, we will have change quicker because the public will put pressure on the politicians and the world could be made a safer place. So that would be my message. At least please consider, um, keep reading about LEAP, look us up on social media, follow us in the USA or in Europe or wherever we have members dotted around the world. And um, consider joining our movement. You'd be very welcome. Okay, Neil Woods, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your insights with us here on the interview. Thank you very much. All the best.